distinguished chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I have chosen this topic because uh, I uh, uh, thought it was the most appropriate one for this kind of meeting called e-cardiology because it's an example of collaboration uh, of cardiologists in an academic institution with uh, our colleagues from uh, the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing also coming from uh, the University of Zagreb. So collaboration of University of Zagreb School of Medicine and Faculty of Engineering. Uh, regarding automatic quantification of Doppler traces and uh, testing possibilities if they can if they provide any additional data on ventricular function relevant to our clinical practice. Cardiac imaging is uh, very demanding nowadays and we obtain not only information about cardiac morphology but uh, many information about myocardial function, blood flow, etc., etc. Not only about myocardium but also pericardium, valves, uh, and many other uh, very important details for clinical decision making. Uh, what we need is very good visualization and quantification of our data and uh, because of that imaging quality, spatial resolution, temporal resolution and processing is continuously under development. What are the purposes of cardiac information? Of course in the center in the focus should be clinical practice, which has to be uh, simple, which, which has to be efficient, which has to uh, allow us to make conclusions using simple, most often online analysis, with uh, at least clinical data as possible to make relevant conclusions. Of course, there is an area of clinical research which tolerates many data, uh, long hours of offline analysis, very complicated approach, and on the uh, on the third side there is uh, cardiac information that should be used for clinical management and auditing, uh, which uh, has the main purpose to improve planning in health system, to make it more efficacious, to uh, uh, establish group of similar patients needing similar care and therefore uh, many rationalizations that are needed in our everyday life. So, but we are doctors and clinical practice should be in focus of our everyday work and all of our efforts. Therefore, we face a problem in our echo labs because they are um, uh, flood with high frequency, frequency workflow and uh, it needs time to obtain some measurements such as uh, measuring of aortic outflow Doppler traces which are routinely obtained by manual tracking. And manual tracking is cumbersome, is time consuming and it's of course operator dependent. Therefore the idea of getting an automatic trace delineation uh, which should reduce uh, the data analysis time but not increasing measurement error was our wish when we stab established collaboration with our uh, engineers. Let's say a few words about first about outflow, uh, aortic outflow Doppler trace quantification. Uh, on the left hand side you can see uh, standard outflow Doppler trace, aortic Doppler trace uh, in HDF image. Then here in the middle there is an automatic signal uh, extraction. Uh, then we can manually indicate ejection time with it, that signal which is got with computerized uh, approach. And then, furthermore, it can be uh, it can be modeled by a particular program, as you can see. And finally, we can uh, have what we call signal feature extraction, which looks like this. So, from this standard 
Doppler trace along the aortic valve, we can get with this approach something like that, which we basically don't understand, but which could have some practical implications, as I'm going to show you. Uh, this uh, blue line is the original model of the aortic outflow uh, trace uh, which we got by continuous Doppler and the, the, the rose line is approximation which smoothened that signal to be more elegant in uh, some calculations we need, some quantifications. And what, do, what can we quantify? on that cubic approximation of the aortic outflow signal. Uh, rise time, sorry, rise time, time to ascending trace uh, value. Then we can have fall time, time of descending trace value. Then we have, of course, time from onset to peak outflow, and then we have ejection time. And finally, we have something what we called uh, a symmetry factor which uh, uh, calculates, which uses this uh, with these areas, uh, areas under the curve, uh, areas uh, uh, which are uh, obtained by dividing the ejection time into halves. So, uh, using this formula, we can get the difference under the area uh, uh, of the area under the curve of left and right half of the spectrum normalized by the overall area. How can it be applied in patients with coronary artery disease? So let's a little bit back to basics. These are experimental data on isolated cardiomyocytes in normal patient, this is the black line, and in patient with ischemic heart disease. As you can clearly see, the patterns uh, are substantially different uh, between ischemic and non-ischemic uh, myocardium. Uh, in uh, non-ischemic myocardium, in non-ischemic cardiomyocyte, there is no delay in onset of shortening. And uh, here, in this red uh, line, there is delay in, in time to peak and relaxation time showing that ischemic myocardium has different uh, pattern of contractility. And of course, there is reduced peak shortening in ischemic myocardium. As we all know, that ischemic myocardium is hypokinetic. This is an example of patients with absent coronary artery disease. And uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we see his uh, transaortic uh, Doppler trace, which is typical trace, uh, triangular in shape with the peak, sorry, what is going on, with the peak occurring early, and there is no evidence of coronary artery disease uh, in that patient, and uh, it has neg he has negative dobutamine stress echo. Uh, his modeled trace is on the right hand side where we can see a typical model for a patient without coronary artery disease. So it's a quick time to peak and it's a quite uh, longer time to uh, a prolonged deceleration time. This curve is obviously an asymmetric one and this is uh, the asymmetry index in that particular patient with the absent coronary artery disease. On the other hand, there is uh, an example of patients with, se patients with severe coronary artery disease with positive debutamine stress, and uh, as you can see, he has typical broadening of the aortic outflow uh, trace oh, sorry, with a much more rounded shape, and the peak comes later than in a normal patient. And on the right side, you can see uh, the modeled trace which is completely different pr from the previous one. I'll just show you the previous one. So it is more symmetrical, it is more rounded, and these numbers are substantially different, particularly this asymmetry factor, which is quite lower than uh, in the patient we saw uh, on the previous slide. So this is just a summarization of what I have said. 
On the left side there is the control group, young, completely health individuals. These are our patients without signs of coronary artery disease and without uh, positive stress dobutamine, uh, which show almost the same pattern of this model as a normal uh, population. And on the right side there is a typical model uh, computerized got, uh, that we computerized got from patients with severe coronary artery disease, showing typical broadening, much more round in shape, and later peaking uh, of the trace. There are some, uh, here you can see some mathematical properties extracted, extracted from the, those models. Uh, and uh, to summarize just uh, all these data, the slide is very busy, I have to say that asymmetry is much uh, lower, significantly lower in CAD positive patients, as well as uh, the time to rise is uh, significantly longer in patients with coronary artery disease. T fall is also uh, T-fall t t is shortened, therefore the trace is more symmetrical. And uh, in, an interesting finding in that context were uh, the patients uh, we called uh, patients with hypercontractility. Uh, healthy patients with CAD uh, negative findings uh, with inducible intracavitary gradient during dibutamine stress echo. Interestingly, uh, during the peak dibutamine, they showed this uh, pattern which was similar to patients with coronary artery disease. And uh, those patients was ob were obviously the group with a sort of high, uh, uh, they were prone to hypercontractility. Uh, comparison of their ejection fraction, the uh, uh, white bar, uh, with uh, patients with uh, coronary artery disease and a normal group showed, in fact, that they are prone to contractility of their, let's call it, normal myocardium. Here you can see correlations between ejection fraction and asymmetry factors, a ratio between uh, 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 ejection uh, uh, time to peak and ejection time, uh, time to rise and time to fall. And these uh, correlations are in concordance with what I have previously shown. Uh, ejection fraction is uh, on the vertical axis. Asymmetry indexes are here. This is the first part of the slide. And you can see a linear correlation. As a higher asymmetry index, the better ejection fraction. Uh, T rise, there is an opposite correlation with the ejection fraction. Uh, then, we, what is in fact the same, but this is the ratio between uh, T rise and ejection uh, time, uh, because the peak comes slower and the ejection fraction in those patients is prone to be lower than in patients with uh, uh, higher values of these parameters. And this is T fall and the correlation with the ejection fraction which suits to what I have previously shown. Uh, on this slide you can see on uh, vertical axis left ventricular internal diastolic diameter and correlations of that diameter with the symmetry factors. So patients with, uh, lesser, uh, with lower symmetry index had showed uh, uh, broader left ventricles, uh, bigger dimensions of left ventricle, and, of course, patients with uh, uh, longer time to get the peak uh, showed also uh, uh, bigger size of left ventricle, uh, indicating that uh, the remodeling in ischemic heart disease has to do something with these data obtained by computerized modeled uh, traces of uh, uh, aortic uh, flow uh, obtained by continuous wave Doppler analysis. And this is practically the same, but shown in a different manner. 
the values of a symmetry index between control group, uh, the butamin stress negative group, and positive group, uh, showing that the lowest index were in this uh, the butamin stress positive uh, population. Uh, then we have this ratio between time to peak and uh, uh, ejection time, showing that the, the, most, uh, the, the highest values were mostly in patients with coronary artery disease. And uh, this is uh, time to rise, showed that time to rise was longer in patients with CAD in comparison with controls and with the butamine stress negative patients. And this is uh, correlations between T4 uh, within these groups, uh, indicating that uh, the T4 was uh, different in, th in these groups and uh, the T4 was uh, longer in, uh, was shorter in patients uh, that showed a positive debutamine stress test. Something we, happened. We didn't hear with, the with the mic. Just a second, but there you and finally, we have uh, application of this method in patients with aortic stenosis. Uh, we know that uh, aortic stenosis can have different severities, and this is schematic representation of wall stress and um, uh, left ventricular pressure between normals and between patients with severe aortic stenosis. And here you can see also various shapes of aortic outflow, uh, uh, transaortic uh, uh, flow obtained by uh, the continuous Doppler in patients with mild, severe, and finally moderate uh, aortic stenosis. And if you compare these schematic representations of outflow, outflow uh, patterns in these patients with, with different severities of aortic stenosis, with our previously shown CAD patients, then you can see some similarities because severe aortic stenosis comes with more rounded uh, pattern in the same way as patients with coronary artery disease, but of course without aortic stenosis because you can see how low uh, the velocities uh, were in these CAD patients. So they had completely normal aortic valve. So this is an example of patient with severe aortic stenosis versus control. Aortic stenosis comes with typical broadening of the signal uh, with a much more rounded shape and later peak. And on the right-hand side, there is a typical normal trace, triangular in shape with a peak occurring early. This is very interesting. We compared uh, the models uh, obtained by uh, uh, trans, uh, transaortic uh, flows uh, in patients who recover their ejection fraction and didn't recover their injection fraction post aortic valve replacement. And you can see, in fact, two categories of patients. No ejection fraction recovery patients post AVR had, as you can see, quite symmetrical preoperative uh, uh, shape of the model and postoperatively the improvement was quite insignificant in comparison with the uh, status previously to operation. The second category are the patients who regardless of ejection fraction and regardless of, of uh, transaortic gradient had, had more asymmetrical uh, model shape and uh, as you can see after the operation the asymmetry of the uh, profile was more pronounced so those patients were, were prone to improve their ejection fraction after the aortic valve replacement and here you can see their asymmetry indexes as you can see initial asymmetry indexes were significantly uh, higher in, in, in that group of patients with uh, the favorable outcome, and uh, the recovery rate was uh, substantially more pronounced, of course, in the, in the group of patients with initially better models than 
the other group. Here are correlations between uh, ejection fraction change pre- and post-surgery uh, versus asymmetrical indexes pre-surgery, and we can see linear correlation. But there was no correlation of asymmetric, asymmetry pre-surgery pre and mean transaltic gradient pre-surgery, as is clearly shown in the right picture. This is rock analysis for a symmetry, Morning. peak gradient, and aortic uh, uh, valve area, comparing aortic stenosis patients with post-operative improvement of ejection fraction and aortic stenosis patients with post-operative stagnation or deterioration of ejection fraction. And we can see that the best predictor of ejection fraction recovery was that asymmetry index asymmetry factor obtained by computerized model uh, from the uh, aortic uh, Doppler traces. Some of our patients underwent uh, magnetic resonance. And this is also quite an interesting. Preoperatively, there were patients with, uh, with low uh, with, uh, uh, asymmetry index, which was very low, and as you can see, they had a uh, very bad ejection fraction post-operation without recovery, and late enhancement has been found in more than 90% of these patients. Patients with asymmetry index more than uh, 0 0.15 recovered ejection fraction post-operatively, and late enhancement was found on MR only in 50% of those patients. Another interesting detail, post-operative patients, also some of them underwent magnetic resonance, and uh, post-operative patients with preoperative, uh, with asymmetry index uh, more than uh, 0 0.15. They could be also divided in two groups, uh, with asymmetry post-operatively, which was less than 0.25, they had late enhancement in 100% and patients with asymmetry index uh, more than 0.25 uh, with less enhancement which has been found only in 58% of patients. So to conclude, sorry, uh, just a second. This was transferred from the Apple, you know, and you never know what can happen when you have Apple and transfer it to the PC. Just a second. In the presence of coronary artery disease, an important percentage of patients show a broadening of the aortic outflow profile, which might be related to a reduction in global myocardial contractility. Decreased myocardial function results in a more symmetrical outflow, while very asymmetrical traces suggest in patients without CAD increased contractility, potentially inducing intracavitary gradients during dubutamine stress echocardiography. Aortic outflow trace symmetry occurs in the majority of patients with severe aortic stenosis, and it is a very important, according to our data, uh, in predicting post-operative ejection fraction change as a higher asymmetry, the better ejection fraction recovery can be expected. And those additional data that we have obtained by automatic trace analysis can provide we hope relevant clinical data on left ventricular function, helping in diagnostics and further patient management strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have time for a short uh, question. Raising. Not I have a comment, mm -hmm. but apparently. If asymmetry can be compared to chaos, it seems that also in this case uh, it's better having a little bit of chaos than uh, being uh, completely, let's say, flat. Uh, <laughs> also, in, from this uh, imaging study, this message uh, comes out. 
like at a variability more is a uh, variability better is the patient uh, status so yes but uh, the causes causes our uh, is subjected to our individual definition maybe the cause is symmetry who knows cause is something which is beyond our perception a problem 